I am François Jacob. I am professor at the Pasteur Institute, where I have been working for about 50 years. And I am Lucy Shapiro, and I am a professor of developmental biology at Stanford University. I have some questions that I would like to ask you and to share with you. Uh, the first, which is something that all of us in experimental science know and understand, is that the laboratory environment in which we work is really critical for the interactions and things that happen in the lab. And this was certainly true for Morgan's lab at Columbia in his famous fly room. And it was particularly true in the attic at the Pasteur when you first joined Andre Levoff. And what, what was it like? What was the atmosphere in that laboratory like? Well, I think it was a very, very exceptional uh, atmosphere. It was, uh, the, the lab was, has a special configuration. It's in the attic, it's a long couloir. And at one end uh, was sitting André Lvov with his people. And at the other end was working uh, Jacques Monod with his people. And uh, there were, it was overcrowded. There are much too many people for the, mm -hmm. for the place. And all the time, people were coming out in the, in the couloir, discussing the experiment, trying to break the experiment of the other and to fight. Mm -hmm. And it was an extremely warm and pleasant atmosphere for, for many years. I think really exceptional. One of the things that was very remarkable during that period uh, in the attic and the whole time of the very beginning of the phage groups uh, was the phage church, or yes. the phage group led by Max Delbruck. And there seemed to be uh, an interesting group of people at different parts of the world. So we had Max Delbruck, and we had Salvador Luria, and we had the attic. What was the relationship amongst these groups? Well, they, they were very good. We were moving back and forth from one place to another. There was some discussion sometime about the, the, the exact uh, subject of our work. For instance, we in Paris were working on lysogeny, which was some kind of a tradition at Pasteur, where many people had, had been working on that. And in Caltech, Max Delbrugge decided that lysogeny does not exist. Oh, really? And uh, he, I think Elie Volman, who was a member of our group, spent uh, one year or two in Caltech, and one day he came to, he found one paper of his father, because his father has been working on that, uh, on lysogeny, and uh, written by Max with the hand, lysogeny doesn't exist, full stop. So that was a kind of, finally we, we, we arrived to an agreement. Yes. But, you know, it seems that there were many things that overlapped between what was happening yes, with Max Delbrook and yours. And was there a lot of communication? Yes, there was a lot of communication. There was no email at that time. There was no <laughs> such thing as fax. Mm -hmm. But still, there were letters <laughs> and even telephone. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of communication. Yeah. And there was a lot of, uh, of meetings uh, almost every year. Uh, mm -hmm. In the summer, there was one or two or three meeting on phage where people were discussing, arguing, and, and trying to s more or less say what they were going to do and trying to e avoid doing exactly the same thing as, as the next people. It was, yeah. it was a very special time. And you know, also adding to this, your role in all of this is that if I go through the time, uh, you had two very significant collaborations. One, of course, was with Wallman. Yes. Uh, which was very special. Yes. And the other, of course, was with Jacques Monod. Right. Um, but Volman and Monod were very different people. Very different. And so what can you compare the interactions that you had with each of them? It, I mean, it was socially already different because Volman was of my age. Monod was much older. Or much, he had 10, 10 years more. So with Volman, uh, Actually, when I arrived in the lab, I had done absolutely nothing. I knew nothing. I had to start from scratch. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And uh, I learned a lot of things uh, of, of everyday life in the lab from him. Uh, with Mono, it was a bit different because he was not clearly a senior. He was already uh, somebody who had, who had work, who had uh, uh, produced a lot of, of paper, so the situation was quite different. Mm -hmm. So when you were working with Wolman, yes. you were also, of course, in Lvov's lab. Yes. yes. So what was the relationship of you and Lvov? Well, I was a student of Lvov. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, when, as I said, I started very late. In fact, I wanted to become a surgeon in my, in my, uh, before the war. Then I went to, I left France and went uh, to join the Free French Army. And I fought for uh, four years. I was wounded the first time in Tunisia and second time very heavily after the landing in, in, uh, in Normandy. And then I, I couldn't be a surgeon because I have a bad arm, a bad leg, etc. So I tried to do almost anything. I tried to do journalism. I tried to become a movie actor. I tried uh, a lot of things. And finally, I decided that I was interested in, in, do ex, in doing research mm -hmm. and in biology. I thought it was too late for me. But I have a friend or cousin of my wife who was in about the same state, had found a lab, was working, and was very happy. So I said, if he, why not me? Mm -hmm. And uh, so then I learned that there were two good labs in Paris. And one with, in, in the, what I had understood is that probably something was going to happen between bacteria, genetics, and, and, and biochemistry, uh, which was not so bad yeah, at that time. I would say. So I, there were two labs in Paris, which are good lab, but one which was much more pleasant than the other, that was Lvov at Pasteur. Mm -hmm. So I came and see Lvov and asked him, may I work with you? He said, I have no room for you. Uh, and for a year, I came every month asking is, uh, if I have no room for you. Finally, I think he, he said, well, you know, we have found induction of the prophage. And I just didn't understand what, what he was saying. I didn't know what induction meant, mm -hmm. what prophage meant. <coughs> I, so he said, are you interested? Yes, I said, I am dying for doing the same kind <laughs> of thing. So he said, OK, come in, in two weeks. So I went to a, a library, tried to find out a dictionary to understand what induction of prophage meant. It didn't mean anything. And finally, I, I found out. But finally, I went there. And I was a student of, of Lvov. I, I prepared the thesis oh. on lysogeny and Lvov. So you got a PhD then? I got a PhD uh, three years later. So you have both an MD and a PhD. And right. a PhD. Right. And your thesis was on lysogeny. That's right. The, and the, the science thesis, yes. Yeah, right. that's really very interesting. Did you ever expect to get a PhD when you started this thing? I mean, did you go to the Pasteur to get a PhD or just to... No, I just to the Pasteur to try to do science. But I've, of course, uh, when you have to, when you want to do research, you have to get some kind of PhD somewhere. So uh, even if I didn't go to do a PhD, it was really likely that I would do a PhD with Wolf. What was Wolf like? as a mentor? He, he was an, uh, a man very precise, very well behaved. He wanted uh, people speaking a very good French. He, he didn't like people speaking any kind of language. Uh, he liked to have good food, good drink. Uh, he liked good things in, in all uh, matters. But he was he had good friends and good enemies. He was very sharp. Mm -hmm. One day, uh, a fellow, he, he was sitting in a committee, and a fellow whom he didn't like at all uh, was asking for money, and the principal was when somebody was asking for money, the other was leaving. He, he was leaving the room, and the other mm -hmm. was discussing. So uh, when his turn came, Lvov said, I would not give him any money. So the man came back and he asked his neighbor what, what was said. And he said, Lvov doesn't want to give you money. 
So after the committee, this man came to Lvov and, and said, I, I should kill you. He said, what do you mean I should kill me? Do you want to do a, a duel tomorrow? So I send you my témoin. And the guy disappeared. <laughs> which means that comités can be very dangerous. Yes, in France, clearly, they can be very dangerous. So this to say that he had very good friends mm -hmm. and very good enemies, too. Mm -hmm. But uh, when you were his friend, you, he did a lot of things for you. And he was extremely nice with me. Uh, he helped me a lot. And when I began to make some more uh, bubbles, uh, he always pushed me uh, a lot. He did. He was a very, very he was special a, yeah, scientist. He was a special man. A very yeah. special man. Yes. You know, in, in your books, you, you often use a phrase, day science and night science. Yes. Which I love. Yes. And, and what, what does that really mean to you? That means that uh, when you talk about science, when you discuss paper, when you write a paper, essentially, you write... Uh, some kind of linear uh, story mm -hmm. which go from one point to another point as if when you started you knew the end, you knew the answer. Well in fact my experience is that in many uh, occasions you have absolutely no idea of wh what you are going to do, what you are driving at, but that's what you, ri wh what you tell. It's not exactly the way uh, it happens. That's true. You, you have to fight a lot with yourself mm -hmm. and with the others, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, during, during the time of uh, the prophage and induction yes. and the, the great excitement that the prophage told us, in other words, that DNA was coming in and out of the chromosome and that it was a startling upset, um, the beads on a string concept stable beads on the yes. string concept was really challenged. Yet in about 1956 in the Cold Spring Harbor Symposium, Barbara McClintock has a paper on controlling elements in the gene in which she hypothesized uh, in that paper that there were inhibitors and activators and things are moving. How was McClintock's work received and talked about and integrated uh, at the Pasteur? Not much. In fact, uh, it was difficult to interact with McClinton. Did you know her? Yes, very well. Uh, yes. Every, almost many times I went to Cold Spring Harbor, mm -hmm. and many times I discussed with her because she was very much interested in the prophage, yes. and she was interested in the regulatory system. But uh, reading her papers was tough. not very easy, yeah, tough. and talking with her was not easy either. Yeah. So in Paris, we, I mean, we knew that she existed, that she had these mobile mm -hmm. elements, but uh, we didn't talk much about that. Yeah, that's a pity. And uh, even with her, it was very difficult to, to discuss and to uh, understand each other. It was not. It was not easy. Yeah. You know, when when Andre Lvov first demonstrated phage induction, and you were accepted into his lab, <clears throat> I've always wondered when he did that experiment. Was he already thinking about the concepts of repression of viral mm. functions, uh, in addition, of course, to the revolutionary concept of inserting foreign genetic material into the chromosome? Was this something that he had thought about before? No, not at all. This came <coughs> from what we call immunity of lysogenic bacteria. Mm -hmm. Immunity means that the, in lysogenic bacteria, you have the phage genetic material, which is somewhere in the, in the bacterium, in the cell. And we learned later that it was inserted into the bacterial chromosome. And the phage genes are not expressed. Yes. And not only are they not expressed, but if you superinfect these lysogenic cells with a phage of the same type, this phage cannot multiply, mm -hmm. and his uh, genes are not expressed. And this we call immunity. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether it was a good word or not. But what I did, I think what I did mainly for my thesis was to understand what it was. 
And what, after a number of experiments, what, what I understood was that, uh, and we, we had with Volman two models. Either uh, there is a block because the prophage uh, in the chromosome prevents uh, expression yes. of, of the of incoming phage, or there is something else. And what I understood with, with during this thesis was there was a cytoplasmic expression of immunity, that there was something, something was there. which prevented expression of, uh, this was called repressor some yes. months later. Yes. And it turned out that it was very similar to the lax system that uh, Mono was. Oh yes, working. I mean that, that, was, that yeah. was the big synthesis, yes. I mean putting those two things together. Another thing I was curious about at that time was in your initial discussions, in your initial arguments about gene regulation, particularly putting these two things together, did you consider positive control as an important possible mechanism, as important as negative control? Yes, yeah, this was a big argument I had with Mono. Mm -hmm. uh, it turned out that the, the, the first cases we studied, which was the, the LAC system, yes. the phage system, lambda, mm -hmm. and the tryptophan system that mm -hmm. we worked with, with Cohen, with mm -hmm. George Cohen, mm -hmm. where we also got mutants, the gene, etc. And it was exactly the same. It was also repression. So, Mono decided that this, with these three cases, repression was a general phenomenon. Yes. And uh, I didn't really see any particular reason why it should be general. Well, there would not be mm -hmm. also some positive uh, regulation. And this especially when we thought of trying to apply these systems to differentiation yes. and development. Yes. And I, I didn't see any reason why that should not be possible to use any mm -hmm. type of system. And we had big, big arguments on this. When was the Arabinos experiment? That was many the years Arabinos later. The Arabinos experiments it? were in, in the 70s? The, no, no, what before was? that it was in the 62, 3, 4. So, so there was positive yes, regulation. Yes. And, and there was the maltose was positive. Yes, yes. And the fetch turned out, the, the profetch turned, turned out, out to be, to be also positive. positive. So, yeah. uh, so why do you think Monod was so hard over on not having positive? Monod considered that he was uh, very logical and he considered that nature had to be logical and that it had to add the same logic as he had. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he was very strong on that. And so did Monod eventually say, okay, yes, there's positive? Well, finally, but after many years, <laughs> especially when Maxim Schwarz. So that maltose, the maltose. maltose yes, was that positive. Yeah. Another experiment from that time, actually one of my favorite experiments, is the one you did with Volman, the spaghetti experiment. Uh, the spaghetti experiment. Sp that, that was an idea of Volman. Uh, mm -hmm. What we wanted to understand, we had this business of conjugation when we have uh, some strains which were donors and other strains which were recipients. We call the donors males and the recipient females. So you mix these two things with markers on mm -hmm. each side and then you get recombinants. So we wanted to analyze the different step and in particular to try to find out at what stage the genetic material from the male was transferred to the female. Mm -hmm. So Eli had this very good idea to use the Hershey system that Hershey had, had used with phage. Hershey had shown that when you use radioactive phage label either with sulfur in the protein or with mm -hmm. P32 in the nucleic acid, and then you infect your bacteria and then you shake in a wearing blender. So you remove, and you can see that in the microscope, you remove the head and uh, you know that the P32 comes into and you find out that having the P32 inside the cell and removing the protein is enough for infection, okay. which was a demonstration, a second time demonstration that DNA is responsible. But the idea was that with the blender you can remove something. So uh, Eli had the idea to put these happy couples uh, in the blender and separate mm -hmm. them in a brutal way. Yes. And we followed markers. And it turned out that when the first marker we followed, 
you find at the beginning, after they have mated, they have come together, you put that in the blender which separate, that there is no recombinant, and suddenly the recombinants appear, which means that the marker has come mm -hmm. into the females. And the second experiment we did was with two markers, which are not, not together. And it turned out that they didn't come at the same time. Which did you expect that? Of course not. That was really a quite Of course a shock. not, yes. So then we did that with five markers, and it turned out that each marker came at a very precise time, and that the time map was the same as the genetic map. And this was called the spaghetti experiment, which Eli was furious about. No, really? It was uh, because it was he tri trivialized it was e it. Yes, it was easy <laughs> to understand. <laughs> so, but, but there's another part to this, uh, which was, I guess, another surprise, and you found this, and that was that there was a circular permutation. We, yes. And um, that was more, more, more complicated. There was this donor. There were two kinds of donors. The, the, the Lederberg strain, Lederberg, who had found the, the recombination system, the mating system, and conjugation system in bacteria, with, with one, with a coli, it was a very lucky, actually, mm -hmm. uh, because there are few strains which have the system for mating. Mm -hmm. And the strain he picked up in, uh, I think, in, in your university. Well, at Stanford. At Stanford. Yes. Was the right one. Yes. It turned out to be the turned right one. Turned out to be the right one. But the recombinant was at very low frequency. There was about one recombinant per 10 to the 6 parents. Yeah. And uh, several people uh, isolated other strains, which were called high frequency HFR strains because they produce recombinant about one in a hundred. It turned out that these HFR strains were bringing the chromosome in the order which you could show in the blender experiment. You had A, B, C, D, E, which come out A at 10 minutes, B at 15 minutes, D, C, and so forth. But we began to isolate several of these strains and it turned out they were not the same. Another strain was uh, uh, injecting uh, D, E, F, G. Another one was injecting C, B, A, Z, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And you could explain that if you had uh, made the hypothesis that you had the circular chromosome yes. in which uh, the sex factor, yes. which was responsible for this, was attaching at uh, mm -hmm. a number of different points and then carrying the whole thing over with it. Was this, was this readily accepted when you suggested that the chromosome was circular? First, it was not accepted by Eli. Who was <laughs> by <laughs> Eli? I don't want the, <laughs> the circular chromosome. Finally, he agreed. But I had a, a big argument in, uh, in London with uh, students of, of Josh who had just come back from Josh lab and she, we, we were supposed to give a talk, both of us, uh, in the symposium of the uh, Society for Bacteriology, an English, British society. So she gave a, a talk with there were three or four or five chromosomes and I gave the talk with this circular and she was again furious because she said that there is no such a thing as circular chromosome until Cairns, Cairns showed that yes. it was really uh, circular. Yes. But it was, the, it was the genetic experiment that got everybody thinking. I mean, there was yes, it was. And I think you, you couldn't escape that, that it was really circular. Yes, and, uh, there was no other way. Yes. Yeah. So we've been talking about a very remarkable time in science, and not just in the Pasteur Institute in general, but in science. And primarily, we've been talking about the experiments that you've done with Volman and with Leboff and the intense discussions, of course, that went on with other people who were in the attic at that time. Who was there at that time and how, how was it organized? There were two groups, essentially the Lvov group on one end, uh, where we were with uh, Eli Volman and another fellow, Pierre Schaeffer, mm -hmm. who was working on uh, on DNA and in and, uh, transformation by DNA of bacillus. Mm -hmm. 
and at the other end was Mono, who had a very good uh, American collaborator, Mel Cohn. Yes. And uh, two ladies, Anne-Marie Toriani, who is now in, uh, in Boston, mm -hmm. and Germaine, who was going to marry Roger Stanier, Germaine yes, Stanier. Yes, that was, that was Germaine Cohn-Bazir. Germaine Cohn-Bazir, exactly, yes. who yes. turned out to be Germaine Stanier afterwards. Yes. <laughs> well, that was, uh, plus, that was the basic uh, people, plus a lot of, uh, of students or mm -hmm. postdoc and uh, various people uh, coming for a year or two years. Yes, wasn't there sort of a chain of people from, yes, from the United of, States yes, and the UK yes, that came yes, through yes, right. and, and did work with you? Right. Yes. Uh, one of the uh, series of experiments that led to new concepts uh, were epitomized by the experiment in which you demonstrated erotic induction, yes. which then became zygotic induction, yes. but I like the first name better. Uh, and then, of course, the pajama experiment. Yes. And both of these, uh, in addition to Minot's coordinate induction of beta-gal and the lat permease, uh, led to the genetic units were more extensive than just the gene, and that regulation could be an on-off switch. And all of these things came together yes. in, in different people were thinking about it and, and you thought about it. But these were all hypothesis driven and they could have helped, the one concept could have helped design the other. So did in fact the, uh, the erotic induction experiment help in the design for you of the pajama experiment? Well, what uh, the, the once we had the timing system of uh, of conjugation, so we knew that Mono has been working on the lacto system, and he had shown that there were at least two genes, like what he called Z, which uh, was responsible for the synthesis of the galactosides and Y, the gene Y, which was responsible for the permease. So these were closely linked, this we knew, and we knew that these two genes at the LAC region was coming at a given time with a particular HFR strain. So one of the questions we asked, the first question we asked was, how much time does it take, if we, if we put the Z gene by conjugation mm -hmm. into a bacterium which is devoid by deletion of the Z gene, how much time does it take to express the galactosidase? Mm -hmm. And this, so this was an experiment that we planned, and, and we planned also at the same time the experiment to understand what the relationship with the, uh, the phenotype index inducibility or not inducibility uh, to try to explain that and analyze that with the conjugation. So the experiment was, the first experiment which was obvious was to put this Z gene by conjugation in a cell in which it has been destroyed by deletion and see how much time it takes. And at that time, uh, Arthur Pardy came in the lab mm -hmm. and uh, we asked him to do the experiment, which he did very well because he's very, a very good ex experimenter. And it turned out that it started almost immediately at full speed, uh, which has a number of consequences as to the mechanism of uh, how, how do you make a protein from the gene. So that was the first experiment, which was called of the pajama series, Pardi, Jacob, Mono, Pajamo, Pajama, that's what I... And this, so it turned out that it was immediately, uh, within seconds, as soon as you can detect it, you get the enzyme, mm -hmm. the activity. And the second experiment we did was to do the same thing with inducibility. I mean, the idea at that time the idea essentially of Mono was that the, 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 the wild type 
coli, K12 for instance, was inducible. But you could get mutants which were constitutive. So this was called I plus, I minus. And the idea to begin with that the constitutive strain were making an inducer which you could not detect. And mm -hmm. that's why they were constitutive because there was an internal inducer. Mm -hmm. And this had, so what we decided to do was to transfer either the inducible gene allele into the constitutive recipient or the reverse mm -hmm. and see how it's going on. And it turned out that when you transfer the constitutive into an inducible, it doesn't make any difference. Mm -hmm. While to transfer the inducible into a constitutive, it stops after about 40 minutes, it stops the, product, the, the, the spontaneous production of enzyme and you can at, at this time induce and, and, and make as much protein as you want. So that proved that the active allele was not constitutive, I minus, but the inducible I plus. Mm -hmm. And at that time, you have to assume that this I gene was making some, something which prevented yes. the enzyme making system of being expressed, except if you had an, an inducer uh, galactoside. So that was the principle of this thing. Now the interesting point was that the fact that the, as soon as the gene was entering the cell, the cytoplasm, the enzyme was made at full speed, was not in good agreement with the idea that people had about protein synthesis. Mm -hmm. Because it was known that the synthesis of the protein synthesis was occurring on small granules which were called ribosomes. And the idea at that time that each gene, grosso modo, one gene was making one kind of, mm -hmm. of ribosome. In other words, uh, the gene uh, responsible for beta galactosidase synthesis or structure was supposed to make a ribosome which was able to make beta galactosidase and nothing else. Mm -hmm. And it was not very likely that uh, you could make specific ribosomes, which are co rather complex structures, protein, RNA, and so forth, uh, within less than a few seconds. So one had to assume that there was something else, that either the protein was made directly on the gene, which was rather unlikely because it was known mm -hmm. it was made on the ribosome, or that there was something going from the gene to the ribosome to tell the ribosome mm -hmm. what to do. And this, for a time, we call X. And this, uh, one day I, was, I, I gave a seminar in, uh, in Cambridge, it was not even a seminar, it was a discussion in, in Sydney's room. Sydney was, uh, had a room somewhere in a, and we had a discussion with Francis Crick and one or two other people. At that time, wasn't, wasn't Sidney Brenner in the same room with Crick? Didn't they share an office? Yes, but it was not in, in the lab, it was in, uh, in one of the, uh, one of the college. Mm -hmm. He was in a college where he has. Oh, he, King's. Probably. He was in King's. He was yes. responsible for the wine. <laughs> for the wine. So really? he had a room in King's. <laughs> so we had this talk in King's in his room, and they had not. They, they were not very much interested in this kind of experiment uh, where you inject them. And mm -hmm. They didn't know very much about this. Uh, LAC plus, Z plus, Y minus, they didn't like it very much. <laughs> Francis was not very much interested. Actually, I told this story in Copenhagen six months before, in November or October mm -hmm. of, of, of 19, one year before. And it's exactly the same story, nobody reacted. And I said the conclusion was there was probably something going from this to that, from the gene to the ribosome to instruct the ribosome yes. to make galactose idea. Nobody reacted. They just read their newspaper. And <laughs> Jim was reading his newspaper. Yes, I've had. <laughs> uh, but 
at that time, uh, they reacted and say, well, of course, uh, it's the RNA described by, what's their name? You know the, the there were two American fellows who have described an, an RNA. Okay, uh, astrakhan. Uh, Vulcan and astrakhan. Vulcan, Vulcan yes. and astrakhan. Vulcan and astrakhan, yes. And yes. one of the difficulties also with the ribosome hypothesis was that the ribosome, the sequence of ribosomal RNA uh, was different from the, from the yes. genes. And the Vulcan and Astrakhan RNA was similar as uh, Bayes' ratio was concerned mm -hmm. with the phage mm -hmm. uh, sequence. Yes. <coughs> so they reacted strongly and said, yes, your X is the Vulcan and Astrakhan. And of course they were right. And we were stupid in Paris not to have thought of that, <laughs> but we were not very much interested by the Vulcan and Astrakhan <laughs> RNA. So, uh, then it was obviously the good point, and we decided with Sydney to try to prove that there was an, an RNA, which later on we called messenger RNA, which was produced by the gene and going to the ribosome to make galactosidase or to make anything else. And to prove that, we tried to use phage because in the infection with big phage, uh, T2, T4, mm -hmm. and so forth, after infection, uh, bacterial proteins stop being yes. made, and the machine makes only the phage protein. Okay. So the idea that if you can label the ribosomes which are made before infection with uh, heavy something, and if you can label the RNA which is made after infection with P32, mm -hmm. then you should find that the P32 comes with the heavy ribosome. Yes. And that was the experiment which we planned. We came to Caltech to do with, with Matt. Uh, Sydney had been invited to spend a month with Matt and I had completely, and a completely different reason I had been invited by, by Max Delbrück. Mm -hmm. So we met there and we decided to do this experiment in which Delbrück didn't believe a word. He didn't <laughs> believe a word on this messenger <laughs> business, as usual. <laughs> and for, uh, so we had one month sharp because we, both of us, we are supposed to, we had engagement, we are supposed to go back to Europe uh, after a month. So we started experiments in Caltech, and it didn't work at all. And Matt was so disgusted that he left and got married. He went <laughs> somewhere else and got married. And then we were left with Sydney, and uh, it didn't work at all. Until Sydney had the very good idea that we had not put enough magnesium in the cesium tube because the cesium was competing with the magnesium yes and instead of putting the usual amount of magnesium which is necessary for ribosome mm -hmm. to join uh, if you put the ribosome in a solution of cesium you have to put much more, much more. magnesium which we did and it worked did and it work at the very very end it, of your it, month we the, probably the last two days or three oh, days goodness. before <laughs> and yes and uh, it's essentially Sydney who did the experiment. Where, mm -hmm. uh, uh, he was very bright at that, and it, it worked very well. And the, the P32 came exactly at the point we wanted it to be, mm -hmm. that is, with the heavy yes. ribosome. So, so this is the first demonstration of, the of messenger, messenger RNA. That's right. Yes. At the same time, Francois Gros, uh, I've been doing an experiment in Jim's lab mm -hmm. to show that the Vulcan extracant RNA exists in growing bacteria, that you have this same mm -hmm. similar uh, turning rapidly RNA with yes. uh, the same composition or the same base ratio as the DNA, not as the ribosomes. That was the messenger business, yes. Yes, that was a really very beautiful experiment. You know, now there's there's this competing way of thinking and doing science 
And the way all of this was done and the way in which we have all been working has always been hypothesis-driven research. Yes. We think about what yes. it could yes. be and then we test it or yes. we design an experiment yes. to figure it out. But with uh, full genome sequences, yes. with these microarrays, with vast amounts of data, people are arguing that a new way of doing science or an additional Which way of doing true. science. I'm not sure it's a new way, but it's, uh, it's another way. Another <laughs> way is yeah. looking at vast amounts of data yes. and not asking a question, well, just seeing if it gives you a pattern. Well, that's very boring. It's boring. <laughs> it's extremely boring. <laughs> Uh, but do, do you think that things, insights, will come from this boring way that you can then build into a no, hypothesis? No, there are clearly things that you, we, will come out, I mean evolution. Mm -hmm. It's clear that if you want to know what's the difference between a chimpanzee and a, and a man, you have some chance to find out by, by the sequence. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much you will know, but you will, you will get a certain number of, of, of differences. And it's likely that for that, this will be, for instance, uh, for the, the infectious bacteria, the bacteria which are, uh, how do you call that? Uh, which pathogen. Are pathogen mm -hmm. and non-pathogenic yes. variant, yes. you find differences and yes. you can say that. Yes, you can find pathogen a pathogenicity yeah, island exactly. or something, yes. So there is a number of things that you can obviously mm -hmm. find out mm -hmm. uh, very clearly and which are difficult to find otherwise. Mm -hmm. And probably for evolution, for many steps of evolution, it will uh, allow a lot. Otherwise, uh, I'm not sure that it, uh, it probably will take a tremendous amount of time, especially because the, of the, the interactions of, of various genes or mm -hmm. various protein, mm -hmm. which it will take years and years to understand. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, to me, it seems most powerful if you can take these vast amounts of data in a genetic system that's well understood. Yes, yes. Because then you have the opportunity yes, sure, to test sure, sure. What, the, what these patterns are, are sure. beginning to show you. Sure. Um, uh, after, right after the work on the Lac Operon, Minot turned to Allosteri. Yes. And you turned your attention to cell division and DNA replication in right. E. coli. Uh, what motivated that decision? Uh, was it in part your interaction with Sidney Brenner, or was no. it based on something else? No, it was Mono started with Zelda. I was not very much excited in the protein work. Mm -hmm. So I, I was interested at the beginning because the repressor had. Allosteri was, uh, was good for repressor. It, it explained how it worked. It explained that uh, uh, if you, you, you had a molecule which has affinity for lactose or these uh, galactosides and for some DNA sequence, and the idea was that you had the affinity for the DNA sequence in the absence of, uh, of the galactoside, where, and then the, the expression, the synthesis of messenger by the neighbor mm -hmm. gene was blocked. Or when you add the galactoside, you change the, the structure, mm -hmm. and then you have no longer affinity for the mm -hmm. what we call the operator. That, that was very nice. But the the the, the play with the protein themselves, I, I was not very much excited. But I was excited by one thing: uh, was that in the experiment that I done, that I had done, when there was a transfer of some gene either by conjugation or by transduction of genes which were not uh, inserted into the chromosome by recombination, this piece of DNA were diluted out. Mm -hmm. They were not replicated. Mm -hmm. And this led me to the idea that probably there are structures which are replicated because they have some kind of regulatory system which that was the origin of the replicon business. Oh, so that's what led you to do yes, those experiments. Yes, yes, that's right. And then it turned out that we had vacation together with Sydney. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was on a beach in France on the west coast. And Sydney had four children, and I had four children. And in the morning, the lady wanted to sleep. And we were supposed to take care of the eight children. <laughs> And while the eight children were turning around, we were drawing uh, structure in the sand. And we came to this idea that maybe 
did have something to do with membrane, that with membrane we could separate. So that was the replicon model. So okay. that was the beginning but of the replica yeah. model. But the idea, the, the, the start of that was the fact that you cannot replicate a piece of DNA which is not uh, part of, of a replicon. Yes, <coughs> because there were pieces lost. They are lost, yeah. You know, when I, when I look back over your career at that time, it's like there were two different lives. There was the life before you came to the Pasteur, oh, and yes. then a very dramatic change in your life after you. Well, but the life before was ra rather dramatic because it was, it was just uh, fighting with the Panzer SS, which was not so relaxing. No, <laughs> <laughs> but but it was. It was so very different from the well, rest of your life. It was completely different, of course. And. And so I have sort of two questions here. One was this very intense involvement in yes. the war, in World War II, and your very intense feelings that you had to do something for France yes. at that time. And then after you came into science, yes. did you again get involved in politics or in your country? So, so there are two questions here. One was, what impact do you think the time you spent, the four years you spent during World War II, in, in, in contributing to how you are, what you're like, how you react to the world, that really did shape you? It had to Oh, yes, have. a lot, absolutely. And, and so how did it shape you? And then did you come back to that again? Well, if you take a fellow who is uh, 17, 18, 19 years old, uh, living in Paris in a small bourgeois uh, environment, Jewish small bourgeois environment. You take <coughs> in, put it in the center of Africa with black people, uh, <laughs> the Germans, the Italians. Uh, so it, 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 it changes you. I mean, it's completely different. So I think uh, the war, and, and then, so I had this experience. Then there was, we came from, uh, Brazzaville on the Congo to the sea and then uh, on Tunisia. You went right through the desert. Yes, yes. From, from, uh, yes. from with the so-called Leclerc Cologne. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we reached uh, the sea where we met with the 8th Army, of the British 8th Army. And then we went to, to Tunis and we fought in, in, in Tunisia. Uh, that, that changed, it's a change of environment, which completely changes the, the, the people. I, I was certainly completely changed by, by this. You had an interesting experience with a German soldier who you met out in the desert. Well, yes, I was sent, there was a <coughs> company which was a, a head of all the others and who wanted uh, an MD, uh, Actually, I was medical officer with two years of medicine, which means, uh, <laughs> uh, and I was sent to join them and take care of the people who had been wounded. And uh, I, I started with two uh, African, uh, how do you call them, uh, brancardier, the people carrying the brancard. Uh, Mm -hmm. And they, they, just, uh, they just just left, so I was you were alone. alone, and I had, I knew about where I had to go, and suddenly I arrived at about 20 meters. It was a black night. I saw a German fellow with his mitraillette looking at me like that, and following me as I was moving with the mitraillette. So I didn't know what to do. I had no arm. Uh, I had just. Uh, sack with Red Cross. So you had no, you had no gun or anything? No, I had no gun or anything. Oh so God. I decided to go on and the guard, he looked at me, followed me with his, but didn't do anything. And I never understood why he didn't shoot. Probably because it, he would have been uh, found out himself. Ah, oh, I see. And it was probably better for him not to make too much well, trouble. Better for, for all of us but that he did that sometimes by night I still see him. <laughs> really? <laughs> yes, that, no, I would imagine yes. that didn't leave. 
Yes. What? So then later on, the second question, have you remained involved in, in, politics? in politics? Not at all, no. Uh, when I came back, I didn't know what to do. When I came back, I had, I had about a year of the hospital <coughs> after my wounds. And I, didn't, I, I, I had my medical, I finished my medical studies. But you have to, in France, to become a respectable doctor, you have to go through a number of, of uh, concours. Uh, externa, mm -hmm. interna. My first concours was in 1939 and was suppressed. It was externa, and after that you have l'interna. So I asked at the assistance public to try to find the, to, to, to go through the interna without being externa. Impossible. <laughs> they decided, so I decided not to, not to do medicine mm -hmm. and try to do something else. So I, I almost become uh, actor, I, I told you, I guess, mm -hmm. etc. and so forth. And finally, I came to, to research. But at that time, I wonder, many of my friends were in politics. And I want to see a big shot in politics. I don't give you his name because you don't know him. And in half an hour, it disgusted me completely, <laughs> but completely. So I never went at so home to politics, up. no. Yeah. No, I had the impression that I had done uh, two big uh, <coughs> stories, the Free French story and the uh, Molecular Biology story, I think that's was all right. Well, then, then you entered a completely different phase. Yes. And um, from what I can gather, you are still fascinated with gene regulation. Yes. Uh, but you wanted to understand it in a more complicated yes, system. Right. And I think it was, you know, quite quite a leap to understand that you were going to use the same kind of regulation in something that was very complicated. And I always wondered why you didn't turn to yeast. Because here you had a eukaryotic system that was a microbe, uh, and you could do genetics, and you could ask questions of cell regulation. Actually, I didn't consider yeast because uh, I wanted an organism which had eyes, which were looking at, at me, which had a soul and a lot of sex. <laughs> and uh, yeast had some sex, but no soul, no uh, eyes. Finally, I hesitated a lot. I had a discussion I met with uh, Sidney and Seymour, Sidney Brenner and Seymour Banzer in New York. I don't remember on which occasion. And they were just uh, shifting Sydney to, to the worm and uh, Seymour to the fly. And that discussed a lot. Uh, and I was very much interested by the worm and the fly. And actually, I tried the worm. The, uh, for, for, I, I asked Sydney to, to give me a, a sample of his worm which he gave me, and I worked for about six months uh, to raise uh, Senorabditis elegans. Sidney was not very happy. Uh, he didn't like very much me to play with that. Really? Finally, I wa what I wanted also, I wanted to, to look for development and for differentiation, and for some reason or another, I wanted to have a cell culture system, to have an organism mm -hmm. and a cell culture. And finally, I, I gave a seminar on uh, Senorabditis on the subject, what you cannot do with. And I turned, and I hesitated with fly more seriously, but it was very difficult to bring the fly in Pasteur because to have a reasonable chance of doing something, you have to bring a number of people. Mm -hmm. And uh, Pasteur, they are mainly infectious disease, bacteria, viruses, uh, immunology, and so forth. While the mouse was obviously important for Pasteur because it's important uh, for uh, disease, for infectious disease, for immunology, and so forth. And that's why the, that was the reason why I turned to, to the mouse. So then, in, in effect, being at the Pasteur Institute had a large impact this, yes. for this particular yes. decision. Uh, also, what else was going on at the Pasteur at the time that uh, 
that all the work on the bacteria was going on. In other words, was the work from, of, of your lab and Manot and, and Lvov uh, central to what was happening at the Pasteur at the time? Or were there other things happening that were... No, there were other things because they, they work on, on, uh, on infectious disease and they have very good uh, results on that. I mean, the way uh, bacteria infect uh, cells and mm -hmm. what you need on the genetics of bacteria and the genetics of cells. No, there was a lot of, of, of other things. Uh, but the, the, in fact, what I, what I wanted to do was the following. In, at, at the time, they were asking, the, the, the government were asking every five years, what should be done in the next five years? Mm -hmm. And I, did, I, and, and I wrote a paper on the Institute of the Mouse. Mm -hmm. The idea being that the success of molecular biology with coli was that people coming from all origin, from all disciplines, began to work on the same organism mm -hmm. and to help each other. Mm -hmm. This should be done with the mouse. Ah. Uh, and explaining that you have to put together the physicists, the chemists, the geneticists, the bacteriologists, the zoologists, and so forth, in one institute. And people didn't understand at all. They say he wants to have an institute built for him. Yeah. Why, why the mouse rather than the frog, uh, and so and so forth. And after uh, six months of, of fight, I, I gave up. But the didn't they ask you to, to run an institute? To, no, to be but, the director of an but, institute but I America. thought it was stupid to to build an institute for me. Mm -hmm. I think the idea was it, was it was an important thing, and I think if we had done that, yes. it was in 70, yes. 1970, uh, we would have been in a much better position in France uh, for doing this kind of work than we are now. now. Mm -hmm. So you're sorry. But they, they just didn't do. understand at all. Nobody, neither the minister nor the head of the CNRS. No, did they understand here at the Pasteur? Yes. They yeah, did. Uh, yes, Mono understand, but he didn't like them very much because he preferred to be the <laughs> Pasteur working on bacteria, but he understood what it was, yes. Hmm. Now, one of the things that clearly interested you is embryonic development. Yes. And not only embryonic development, and, but also cell differentiation. Yes. Because clearly this had to be highly regulated. Why did this pull at your imagination? Because it was clear, yet I mean, it, the beginning of, of gene regulation is the fact that you have an, an organism which has the same genome in all cells and different expression mm -hmm. in, in different cells. So, Morgan actually was the first to say you probably have differential activation of, of genes mm -hmm. for differentiation. Mm -hmm. But there's another layer on top of that, yeah, which sure, I know you think sure. about, and that is embryogenesis. Yeah. lets you go from a one-dimensional or linear molecular biology to a three-dimensional structure. Yes. What do you see has been learned about translating information from a linear genome to three-dimensional space? And has this come from work on embryogenesis and development? This, we are just beginning to learn this type of thing. Mm -hmm. And at that time, it was completely out of of question. In fact, if molecular biology was so successful, it, it was because it was playing with one dimensional structure. Yes, yes. Uh, so that, that was, a f it could not be more simple mm -hmm. in this respect. And even the way protein folding occurs is not understood today. Uh, and the 3D interaction of cells is just very barely beginning to mm -hmm. to come. The cell-cell interaction, the fact, uh, the action of, of small molecules on this, uh, it, it, it's just beginning. Mm -hmm. But this was something that was clearly in your mind when you yes, started sure. this. It was, but it, it was not much more than in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> also, but what was on your mind is, um, behind really, I, I thought, your decision to turn to mice was the supposition that there was a close relationship uh, between embryogenesis and cancer. 
Yes, that's right. And uh, what led you to that at such an early stage? I mean, that was fairly prescient. Because, uh, because I think it, cancer was clearly a disease of, of, of regulation. Mm -hmm. And clearly, cell regulation is the thing which make embryogenesis and lead to the adult. So if you assume that you have a series of reactions which lead to the cell differentiation and formation of the embryo, and if you assume that cancer is a disease of regulation, then they are interacting, obviously. The question was where and at, at which level, and, and this also led me <coughs> to play with this, with the embryonal carcinoma cell. Yes, the, the teratocarcinoma. Yes. yes. <laughs> One of the concepts that you think about and write about a lot is a combinatorial system composed of a finite number of parts. Yes. Uh, and this, this I think the whole world is built like that. Everything. Everything is built like that at any stage. Um, this, this whole concept has really led to a, a radical change in perspective uh, in the 1990s based on all yes. the other things that have happened. So let's say we are at a time when we know all the parts. Yes. That, like engineers, we have parts on the shelf. Yes. Um, and it's how they're connected that's yes. critical to make each individual different from another individual or a species in different from another species. Do you think that the study of circuitry in a simple model cell, eukaryotic model cell, let's say, will be a value in understanding circuitry in a human. I think you finally have to, to dissect. Every, I, I don't think you can make simple models of that. You have the parts of the circuitry. You mm -hmm. can build every kind of circuit you want, but you cannot predict which circuit will be operating in this or that part mm -hmm. of the body. Mm -hmm. So I think you just have to find out and describe it. Now, in, in your book, The Statue Within, yes. uh, you state that at the time you were working in the attic, you knew you were participating, and I quote, in one of the great adventures of the century. Yes, that's the impression I had. And now in the embryology analysis of mammals and the post-genomic research that's going on, what do you predict are going to be the next great adventures, or there, have there been some? There is one thing which is clear, and when you predict the future, you're, you're sure to be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you know that the future will not be like the present, mm -hmm. but if you predict how it will be, you're sure it will not be like that. <laughs> <laughs> one of the most extraordinary things, which was completely unpredictable 15 or 20 years ago, is the fact that the molecules of bacteria are the same as the molecules of humans. I mean, the fact that the, the, the structure remains the same, yes. or yes. that you just uh, tinkering a little bit with them uh, permits all possible variations, this I think is really, it was un unbelievable 20 years ago to okay. think that the same ox gene would act in a worm, in a fly, or in a human was unthinkable. Yes, it was amazing. Absolutely unthinkable. Yeah. And the other, the other, amazing thing, or I believe, are the oncogenes. That yes. So it's a bit the same kind of same thing. thing. Yes. yes. Because if these are this, the oncogenes are, are genes uh, which act in, in, in Drosophila on, on a different way. Yes. But they are the same. And once again, it's uh, maintenance of, of structure mm -hmm. all along the evolution. This, I think, is really extraordinary. So you've done very many remarkable things. And in anyone who's had the kinds of accomplishments that you've had, it's always interesting to try to understand who and what influenced you as you were growing up, as you were a student, and as you were an adult scientist. Were, were there people early on in your life that had an impact on you and how you worked and how you thought about your life would be? Yes, I think probably my, my grandfather has a big influence. 
I mean, he gave me a lot of books, choosing very precisely which or what book uh, at what age. Mm -hmm. And I was fed with Greek mythology when I was very young, which I liked very much and I still like. Mm -hmm. And he gave me a lot. And I think he was very influential also for the behavior in life and for moral attitude. And also, I was very bored at school. Mm -hmm. I found school very boring. Mm -hmm. But probably you are influenced by, by some teachers. And after, of course, the people with whom I work have been very influential, uh, both from a new certain way. Well, one of, I'll ask one final question, and this is something I've been curious about, and it's, it's not science. And of all the many books that I've read written by scientists, they're all very interesting but none are as literary as yours. Uh, you are a remarkable writer. Thank you. Uh, are you going to do more writing? Uh, yes, I think I, I, I should. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what I find surprising in the, in the books of, uh, of scientists, and especially in the autobiography, is that the they seem to be interested only in what they have done and mm -hmm. not in their life. That's right. And I think in the, in, in the Sydney's book, for instance, we have some kind of autobiography, not mm -hmm. very much. But he tells mainly about his experiments. And, and I find the more interesting part is when he tells the story when he was a boy in South Africa. Yes. Uh, that's not expected, while the other things mm -hmm. are more or less known. Yes. But I think uh, generally the scientists want to get completely pure, dehumanized people, <laughs> which is ridiculous. Yes, it is ridiculous. Well, I for one hope that you write some Thank more. Thank you. Thank you very much for this wonderful conversation.